Awesome. Well, we are so excited that you've all joined us today for our next pipeline webinar series. Um, this is episode eight, crisscrossing the Capitol Beltway. Um, we're going to be discussing two underground crossings of the Capitol Beltway near Washington, D.C. And I'm coming from you uh, from Spokane today. And our client who we'll introduce here shortly, Tucker, is sitting across from me today, which is pretty great. He's based out of Spokane. Um, and we'll get to more intro shortly. Let me click this here. Um, just as a reminder, if you have ideas that you want to share with us on upcoming webinars that you'd like um, our experts to talk about, reach out, let me know. Um, we do have episode nine scheduled for this fall related to hydraulic fracture, um, and we'll have a discussion with Ian Moore from Queens University. So more details to come on that. As stated in the email, I'll send out um, a recording of today's uh, webinar, as well as a certificate of completion, uh, so you can self-report it for education credits. And feel free to forward that to anyone, as well as uh, go to our website to view all past webinars, and I can send you certificate of completions for those as well. If you have questions during today's webinar, go ahead and put them in the chat. You can do them directly to me or put them in, and I'll uh, pitch them to our moderator, John. Uh, if you have questions after today, also reach out and let us know, and we'll make sure we get an answer to you. As we do with everything, this is just a quick disclaimer. The views and information and opinions expressed during this webinar are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of their respective organizations. So with that, I get the pleasure of introducing our moderator. Most of you know him, John Robeson, uh, principal engineer with GeoEngineers, 25 years of experience still, licensed in 15 states. We'd love to tease him about that. Um, he's an expert in trenchless, including HDD and direct pipe, and in geotechnical engineering on pipeline projects across the US. He's our pipeline system lead nationally. And there's a lot of fun facts we can do on John. Um, but he has, this one is just really great. He has five kids and two grandchildren. I always tell him like, what, how do you have grandkids? And so anyway, I just love it. So um, John, I'm gonna toss it over to you. And I'm regretting uh, letting you take that picture. Oh, I love this photo. <laughs> it's so good. The best part is it's like the hat doesn't even fit you. And it's like, what? So. Do we, uh, by the way, do we have like a fabulous prize or something? Oh my that gosh, you we do have fabulous prizes. So yeah, so I'm going to put some questions in the chat and just to engage with folks and be thinking as usual, like if you're the first person to ask a question, um, we will set a prize to you as well as I'm going to put one of the songs that we had at the beginning and you have to guess which presenter chose that that song the one I'm going to do is take it easy by the eagles let me know out of the individuals that present out of uh Tucker Gary John and Matthew who you think chose that song for today's webinar all right thanks uh are you still running the slides April can you advance it very good okay thank you uh, so we'll start with just a quick safety moment, uh, like we do on all these uh, webinars. And the uh, the one that I had that I had thinking about this came to mind for me going into the summer was, uh, and we talk about this pretty regularly, but it's 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 come a little closer to home for me recently. Is uh, the importance of sunscreen and regular skin um, checks. Uh, and uh, as we get into the summer months and people are outside and, and they're getting more sun, both from a recreation and a, and a working outdoors standpoint. And so, uh, and so I recently had my uh, swimming annual check and they found some, uh, some basal cell cancers that I'm getting ready to get cut out. And so, um, you know, really, really came, ahead, came home to me closely to encourage the the folks in my in my world to uh, to make sure they're taking care of that uh, it's important so uh next slide please okay so we've got a couple special guests so the way this is going to work today gary's going to give first give a uh sort of um maybe half hour or so introduction to the project that we're going to talk about it's a really exciting project for us and, uh, and then we're gonna have some of our team members from the project uh, come online with us and we're gonna answer some questions and hopefully have a good discussion. And one of those team members is uh, Tucker Tolke. He's with Michael's um, contractor and he, they're, they're 
team was responsible for the direct pipe on this project that we'll be talking about. We've worked with Tucker quite a lot over the years, and uh, you know he's he's a really good resource on the uh, you know as a contractor in the particularly in the direct pipe world, and he's got a cute little French bulldog. So uh, that's I didn't know about that until today. So thanks for sharing those <laughs> those photos, uh, Tucker. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our other uh, special guest today is Matt Rudd, and that's a very professional looking picture, <laughs> Matt, compared to both mine and Tucker's. Uh, but Matt's been a, a real good client for us. We've gotten to know him um, over the last uh, few years, and uh, he's uh, uh, in the construction group at, at Dominion Energy in Virginia. And uh, evidently, I didn't know this about him. He lives on a golf course, but doesn't doesn't golf. So he must just like the views from the, from the course, I guess. So, uh, so Gary, as he's done on a couple of these, is going to be our lead presenter today. Uh, Gary has over 20 years of uh, trenchless uh, engineering experience, actually twin, uh, contractor and engineering experience. So he kind of brings a pretty unique perspective having started as a uh, um, a laborer on HDD rigs and then working his way into now he uh, just recently got his master's degree in engineering and and uh, so he's kind of done the full gamut of, <laughs> of work from from that perspective and working on owners teams yeah. and and working as a consultant and a contractor so uh, Gary's always got a really interesting perspective and you, you uh, do you want to go ahead and share your screen Gary sure. I think April stopped sharing hers and as you saw from the photo, he's also um, uh, a rodeo guy. So, uh, you know, uh, cowboy up, Gary. It's, <laughs> you're up. <laughs> yeah, uh, my family and I love to rodeo. It's one of the one of the family things that we do together. So it's, a, it's always a lot of fun. <laughs> but appreciate the introduction, John, and happy to have Matt and Tucker here. As you mentioned, this was a really cool project for us. Um, it was. It's actually out in uh, Washington D.C. I'll get into a little bit more with that, but it was. It was actually our our second project with Dominion on the electrical side, and and my first. You know, the, the first Dominion project, electrical project I did with them was really my first ever experience with underground electrical uh, installations. So it was quite. You know, these couple projects we've done with Matt have been quite a learning curve. So today we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to you know kind of go through and give you a project overview. We'll talk about the initial route, which considered uh, consisted of two HDDs, path A and path B, as I'll uh, describe in a little bit more detail later. Um, but path B was actually completed with HDD technology. You know, it wasn't without incident, but it was completed. So we're not really going to focus as much on that uh, particular crossing. But we'll talk about path A construction or HDD construction and how we how it led us to the direct pipe. But then we'll talk about, you know, how we uh, supported Dominion by jumping in uh, and helping out providing the direct pipe uh, design. And then, you know, we followed that design through into construction. And uh, Matt asked us to even stay out and help uh, help with the thermal grouting. And then we'll, as, as we talked about that, you know, we'll, after we go through all the, pre the, uh, the presentation and kind of understand a little bit more about the project, then we'll have some good, good discussion. So the project uh, was actually located in a very densely populated area, about 10 miles west of Washington, D.C. Not often that you end up doing a lot of underground work and you know in the near near the nation's capital, but it began at an existing uh, electrical substation known as the Idlewood substation and terminated at an existing uh, substation also, uh, which was the Tyson substation. So it was you know about four and a half miles roughly of 230 kilovolt underground kilovolt underground transmission line, and you know, we were mostly you know there with a with the trenchless installations, but there at that. Project also had some upgrades to, to their uh, stations, substations, and stuff. You know, as you can see on the screen here, the vast majority is open cut. You know, all the the blue alignment is is the open cut sections, um, and then you see the like the kind of pinkish or reddish down near the bottom of that image. That's actually you know the where the uh, trenchless crossings took place, and the, the trenchless crossings covered a lot. You know, I sixty six. They were beneath I sixty six. The Washington Metro area, uh, transit authority, railroad tracks, I-495, which is the Capitol Beltway, huge, huge road, <laughs> I think uh, like eight or nine lanes in each direction, something like that. And parts of the Washington and Old, Old Dominion Trail, which used to be a, an old railroad, but now it's uh, they've converted into green space and it's like a bike trail and stuff like that. 
Um, so talking about the initial, you know, the initial HDDs, you know, this image is actually uh, of those initial uh, HDD designs. The, the design work was completed by another engineering firm that specialized in electrical transmission design. Um, and then eventually, you know, as the design progressed, a notable HD contractor was awarded the, the construction scope of work. And they determined at some point that a redesign was needed. Uh, basically, there was some con potential conflicts with our conflicts with uh, some columns that were supporting a bridge over 495. It was part of the WOND trail. Um, path, uh, the path A uh, installation is, uh, I believe, in red. Double check here. Uh, yeah, path A is in the red line that you see on there, and path B is the blue line. Um, since these are electrical installations, you know, they, they couldn't be very close side by side. They had to have horizontal and vertical separation as much as possible. Is that the closer the, the electrical lines are, you know, that they actually can affect that uh, the uh, electrical uh, delivery characteristics like the impasse and things like that. So those were all factored into the design. And as you see yeah, on there, that, you know, the path A actually had a little bit of a, of a curve in it, horizontal curve in addition to the vertical curves. Well, there's depth considerations yes. there too. You can't go so right. deep. And, yeah, yeah it, it, the shallower, the better with electrical installations. And we'll touch a little bit more on that on, on a future slide. So kind of like any uh, typical um, transverse installation, you have a Dominion engaged an engineering firm to do the design work and they engaged uh, another engineering firm to actually do geotechnical explorations. So these these are these images are actually the board logs from the initial uh, subsurface exploration program um, completed by a reputable uh, you know a geotechnical engineering firm. So you know they did did a really good job there. Um, the surface, subsurface conditions were generally reported as lean clay variations of sandy silt, silt and sand, overlying saprolite and weathered schist. And saprolite is basically a weathered, highly weathered rock that that kind of degrades down to sand and um, and you know alluvial type or uh, sand and soil type material, but it's, it retains some of the form and characteristics of, of the rock, uh, the parent rock. And it's important to note here, you know, that the weathered schist was identified through sampling of sandy silt. And that would become important a little bit later when we talk about some of the work that we went, you know, that was done before we went into the direct pipe. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Path B was successfully installed with HDD technology. Um, there were some IRs, which will be a, an, an important topic we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later. In inadvertent returns. Inadvertent returns, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I just get used to, you know, the, the, lingo. the jargon, yeah. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, you know, we're not really going to talk much about Path A other than it was completed, you know, done well with some IRs, but they didn't affect the project, well, generally Path speaking. B was completed. I always get the yeah, path, stuff. Yeah, path, path B. B came before A. Yes, we yeah. did Path B yeah. first. Uh, it just it just sort of worked out, you know, the contractor was able to set up on path B easier than path A, yeah. so they knocked path B out first. Yeah. Um, so path A constructions began on May 3rd, 2021. I'm, I'm going to tell you the dates because it's important that you understand that because this is going on in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, which is also something that kind of uh, factored into some of the decisions and the way that you know, the project was handled and, you know, some of the good work that Michael did that we'll talk about a little bit later on. And because of the shallow, shallow uh, depth of cover, you know, below, you know, just a shallow uh, profile depth, I should say, you know, the, that contractor elected to use the pilot hole intersect method to drill a pilot hole. And the thought process there is, you know, the fluid has a shorter distance to travel to get back to either end. So that's a, a good uh, contingency measure, you know, going in if you're worried about, you know, having an IR being able to do that or inverted returns. From, from here on, I'm going to say R, so I hope everyone understands what that is. Um, so pilot hole on path A, the pilot hole operations progressed uh, pretty pretty well, you know, for a little while. On May 5th, uh, an IR occurred about 200 feet west of the eastern pad, you know, towards uh, I-495. Uh, and it was about 25 feet south of the alignment. Um, you know, it was found. Uh, was contained, cleaned up, um, and really didn't pose much of a problem for the project. So, you know, pilot hole operations resumed. On May 8th, uh, another hour occurred, and this was definitely not a good one. Uh, it was uh, it was in uh, I-495 southbound lane and about 400 feet west of those lanes. 
Um, the pilot hole was at this point, the pilot hole is nearly complete. It, as you, if you look on the image here, this is our actual uh, tracking sheet from our build reports. Um, the magenta lines are, are being drilled, you know, the pilot hole being drilled from the east side. The blue lines are, are, are recorded as the pilot hole is drilled from the west side. So as you can see there, I mean, they're, that contractor was so close to completing the, the pilot hole intersect. They were roughly about 32 feet or one range two drill pipe point away from completing that intersect. Um, um, but unfortunately, you know, we had to, we had to stop um, there. Uh, you know, obviously health and safety of the general public is a big deal, especially whenever you have such a heavily traveled roadway. You know, we wanted to make sure everything was done properly. So, you know, we stopped. Um, Dominion, uh, Dominion then uh, reached out to the HDD contractor, requested a, a corrective action plan. And, you know, as you can imagine, they notified the, the Virginia Department of Transportation, which I'll call VDOT uh, for the rest of this presentation. So, you know, VDOT, you know, we're, was very concerned as we, as all was the entire project team about, you know, like I said, the general health and safety. So they provided some very specific instructions to Dominion on what they want to do before the uh, see done before the roads were returned to service. So VDOT, uh, which included core in the pavement here, as you can see, it's pretty big. They're cutting a pretty good sized core out of the pavement with the intent of being able to remove the fluid that may be under the that subgrade or the base of the highway in the roadway base. Um, as you can see here in these images, uh, you know, continuing on with to address VDOT's concerns, you know, we had uh, vacuum trucks come in to these uh, cores, from, you know, pull the fluid out, and then you know, once all the fluid was pulled out of the, you know, that could be you know pulled out from beneath the roadway, you know, uh, Dominion then temporarily patched those cores. Uh, VDOT came out, or, or they were actually out there for a, a, a good portion of this work, you know, just watching it. But they they came out, did an inspection, were satisfied with the uh, corrective actions that Dominion had taken place or Dominion had done. So they were okay for us to return the highways to service. So we closed the, you know, opened the lanes back up, and uh, you know, traffic resumed uh, flowing on those lanes. So the next things, you know, we're now we're kind of concerned about you know reactivating these hours. So as part of that correction, that corrective action plan, you know, we we helped Dominion by you know throwing out some options that included, you know, maybe realigning the, 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 the drill path to, to get away from the area, you know, that had been affected by the, by the IRs. And we also thought about, you know, maybe dropping the profile a little bit, which, you know, as John mentioned a little while ago, it's kind of difficult to do with electrical, uh, um, electrical pipe or electrical installations, primarily because, you know, it affects the impacity and things like that. And, if the, you know, if the installation is completed, but, you know, you're not getting the electricity throughput that you need, there's really no point in doing it, right? So we, we looked at, into a lot of different options. We, we even actually went out and said, okay, if we could find shallow bedrock, you know, we could drop that profile in the shallow bedrock, you know, if it's competent enough, and that goes a long ways into, you know, helping to reduce the potential for those hours. So, you know, we completed some additional geotechnical explorations, um, but we just weren't able to find any competent bedrock. We went down considerably deeper than Matt would have probably ever allowed us to situate the profile, just to see if we could find it anywhere. <laughs> and we weren't able to. So, um, you know, working through it with a contractor that was the HDD contractor, they were, you know, they were very reluctant on any realignment or any profile modifications. You know their position on the matter was let's complete the pilot hole then you you have that hole you know you have a, a you know a clean pathway from either side which will help the fluid go you know where it needs to go but you know we had a lot of conversations with dominion and matt and his team and you know we were just very reluctant to say that we would we would be okay with that you know we were very concerned with reactivating the pilot you know the, any of those frack outs and that areas had been affected enough that we didn't want to see anything more come up in the roadway even if it was you know, even if the drill path was a little ways away, it could, you know, mud could have migrated or drilling fluid could have migrated into something that had already been affected. So at that point, you know, John and I said, you know, I think, I think a direct pipe might be a good option here. <laughs> and, you know, I think John and I probably talked about it well before, uh, you know, this being a good option for a direct pipe well before even the HDD started, you know, with the shallow depth of cover settlement, you know, beneath uh, 495, you know, being a concern. But, you know, at any rate, you know, it was at this point, you know, when we finally put the nail in the coffin on the on the path A HDD and said we got to do something else, so that led us to the direct pipe option. We had a lot of conversations with uh, with Matt and his team, you know, kind of explained to them some of the benefits of the direct pipe, and you know, eventually, you know, I think we all came to the determination or the conclusion that you know, direct pipe was the only way to proceed. 
So um, we actually started, you know, Matt asked us to, to provide some uh, direct pipe, detailed direct pipe design. So, you know, he engaged us to do that in July, 2021. You know, we, as part of our design, we prepared, uh, you know, project specifications, you know, detailed engineering, you know, detailed design drawings. Um, we also looked at, you know, the wall thickness and the grade of the pipe that we would want to see used for a jacking pipe. And that was the point, um, and the OD obviously too as well was a big consideration there. And that was a, actually probably the point where we learned that, you know, leaving the, the steel casing or the jacking pipe in would not be an option either. Because again, you know, that all would also affect, you know, the, the, the current throughput or the electrical throughput, uh, at, you know, and, you know, maybe, maybe uh, to the point where it would, would just wouldn't be satisfactory. So we, as part of this, we kind of came up with a plan, you know, there's two really two options that we could come up with on how we could, you know, get the direct pipe, complete the drive, and then install the 36 inch uh, HDPE casing that was needed for the, you know, for the, uh, to house the interducts that would eventually be put in. So um, one of the methodologies that we came up with was, um, you know, completing the drive, removing all the umbilicals and things like that from inside the jacking pipe. And then installing the 36 inch casing inside the 42 inch jacking pipe or sacrificial jacking pipe and extracting the sacrificial jacking pipe and leaving the, you know, the casing, the HDP casing in place. Uh, the other methodology that we thought through was, you know, completing the drive and then connecting the HDP casing to the jacking pipe, pulling it in as the jacking pipe was extracted. And we, um, so we, we kind of left both of those options open. We completed, like I said, 90% design and that went out along with the project specifications and such as part of the bid package. Um, we, we left it like that because we wanted to leave whatever, whoever the selected contractor was, the, the ability to you know, have their opinions uh, considered on what would be the most appropriate or the, the, their preferred method to, you know, to install the, the HDP. And also, you know, we, there were some overhead power lines there as well. So we kind of went at a 90% design also to leave a little bit of flexibility with any design modifications of the actual, you know, the, the launching area um, that would may accommodate, you know, ease of pipe handling or things like that. So, you know, went on, went on, um, continued to support Dominion as they went through and uh, basically interviewed uh, three potential uh, direct pipe contractors. You know, all, all had good proposals, good technical proposals and things like that. But Michaels was eventually selected to install the Path A direct pipe. I think they were selected around August of 2021. And right after they were selected, you know, they started submitting a lot of good plans. You know, there was a lot to think through in, in, on this project, a lot, really a lot to unpack there. So, uh, you know, we continue to support Dominion by providing like a technical review on their plans and, uh, you know, helping really, you know, Michael's understand where, how we had gotten here. And then as part of their, also as part of their package, you know, Michael's proposed a uh, redesign on, uh, on the crossing. It was a very slight redesign on the launch side. Primarily, you know, we assumed that Mike, you know, that's a selected contractor would maybe want to do a surface launch, um, but Michael's came back and said they wanted to do a pit launch. So it was a slight uh, a redesign to accommodate that. And also I think it was a, we dropped the angle a little bit, I think too, just to help with uh, the pipe handling uh, uh, situation on the launch side. Uh, so also during you know all the, de the detailed design phase, you know we also continue to support the Dominion by attending various meetings with uh, with BDOT. Um, as as I mentioned earlier, we were all pretty concerned with settlement beneath I-495. As part of our detailed design work, we actually ran several scenarios uh, calculations on to you know estimate potential settlement beneath 495, which factored into a lot of what we did. Uh, VDOT had some very, very uh, good concern or very, very, uh, you know, good concerns, <laughs> very, good, very good conversation with VDOT and Dominion. So after, you know, as things kind of progressed, um, we started, you know, Dominion asked us, hey, if we could help with the settlement, you know, if we could help pre prepare like a settlement monitoring plan. Um, so we looked at it and we came up with two, two ways. Um, you know, the first way was conventional survey. Um, basically, but you can't put anybody in the, you know, in the travel lanes or you know, in the median on this highway. It's just, it's too heavily traffic, you know, a lot of heavy traffic, a lot of, a lot of fast traffic as well. Was, we were concerned about the health and safety aspect there. 
So what we, you know, for the conventional piece, we had, uh, we set up settlement monitoring points on the shoulders of the roadway and then on the W and O and D bridge. Uh, so that the surveyors could access it down the right of way and not put themselves in harm's way trying to negotiate traffic or anything like that. Um, and then we came up with a something that was sort of new to me, um, a, a mobile LIDAR uh, uh, solution. And basically it's a LIDAR uh, system mounted on a vehicle. I think it was like a pickup truck they mounted it on, um, collects the data, and then they, you know, they bring it back and process it. And we usually got it like a, you know, kind of early in the morning the very next day. Again, you know, a lot of heavy traffic on this roadway. Um, people not maybe not necessarily paying as much attention as they should. So, you know, with the, keeping you know the health and safety of those of those folks and you know on the forefront forefront of our minds, we ask that they do they collect this data at like 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. kind of way off peak hours. You know, most of the time, man, you know, people are not not going to be going to work at two or three o'clock in the morning out there. So, it worked out pretty well. And this is a this is kind of an image of what of the data we were able to provide Matt on a daily basis. It shows the point cloud um, that the, you know that the surveyor or the lidar was able to capture, and then they use change detection software to basically to, to see you know how things had changed from the day before. You know, lots of data, lots of points are collected you know with, with lidar data, so it turned out to be a pretty good solution. Um, and then actually, you know. We, we actually had the opportunity to test it as well. Um, there was some road work going on as part of the survey corridor. So they were able to detect anomalies that were, I, I can't remember, very, very small anomalies went from the on the pavement. And, you know, we took pictures, we asked them to take pictures of them just to document, you know, that it was pavement milling and it wasn't actually settlement induced by the direct pipe operations. So pretty cool, uh, kind of stumbled onto some pretty cool technology and a pretty cool application for it. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, they, they, Michael's proposed a slight uh, redesign to our initial direct pipe design to allow them to, uh, to launch from a pit. So we evaluated that and we were able to incorporate that into the redesign and we issued our final design report uh, on September 23rd, 2021. Incorporating, you know, all the, all the uh, comments from Michael's, all the comments from, from Matt and his team. So you know, we felt like we had a pretty good uh, uh, set up there, you know, in terms of the design and the engineering and stuff, we thought we were pretty ready to go. Um, so Michaels began Path A uh, direct pipe construction during uh, September of 2021. Basically, the first steps that they did were to go out and actually excavate the pit, you know, put in or put in sheeting, excavate the pit, you know, get it get it ready set up for a, for a pit launch. Um, these two photographs were taken like 12 days apart, so you can see, you know, from from uh, the first day, you know, whenever they had the sheeting and the excavation done, they were working very quickly to get, get things set up. And you can see in the lower photograph on the right, they actually even have the vertical uh, stand or the vertical casing set in for the put in already here as well for the, the rack for the thruster frame to, to you know, ready the reaction part for the thruster frame. And then you can see in the background over the top of the mini excavator, uh, there's a 60 inch lock chasing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Michael's continued to rig up and commissioning the, the MTBM through the month of October. Um, they found, you know, they were able to launch on October 21st of 2021. And here's some pretty cool pictures of the launch. And the, the first, uh, the upper left hand is the, is the cutting surface on the MTBM. And, you know, you can see a cut uh, on the lower photograph going through the, actually going through the launch seal and, you know, some final preparations in the, in the upper right photograph there. So uh, they complete, Michael's completed the drive after 110 production shifts on March 4th of 2022. Yeah, it was a successful drive, but it was definitely not without challenges. There were some technical challenges and some non-technical challenges. We'll talk a, lo a little bit about a couple of the technical challenges uh, in the next couple of slides, but um, some, you know, I'm, I already mentioned the, the biggest non-technical challenge was how to manage the COVID-19 panic, you know, <laughs> pandemic, I should say. Uh, folks, <laughs> folks were, uh, you know, very, concerned about their health uh, and the welfare of everyone around, you know, Michael's handled that famously, you know, that they implemented very good procedures and, you know, and all their staff, you know, did a very good job in, in adhering to those procedures. And those, the procedures that Michael's implemented, you know, I'll say too, they, they didn't just pertain to the Michael's folks, you know, anyone coming on the site was expected, regardless of whether it was Dominion or geoengineers or anyone, you know, they were expected to, to, to use those same protocols. 
So I think, you know, I think that went a lot, a long way into helping, you know, manage people's fears and concerns associated with the, with the pandemic that was going on. So here's, uh, here's some photographs of the actual recovery of the MTBM. I put these in here because it's, it, you know, it's not often that you get to see something in school, but also to, I wanted to point out, look at the wear on the MTBM on the cutting surfaces. I mean, the, it's very, 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 very much worn out. Um, and, you know, this will come up here in the next couple of slides, but I just thought it'd be pretty cool to see what it looks like coming out of the ground there. Um, so the graph that you see here uh, is, uh, it's, a, it's showing penetration rates as a function of tunneling distance. If you can, you may not be able to see it very well, but if you can, you know, you, the penetration rates start trending down at around the 2,000 to 2,200 foot mark. And they kind of continuously, you know, trend down until the recovery. Um, probably, you know, indicative of the wear. You know, as the as the cutter, cutting surfaces get worn out, you know, things start going slower. And as you'll see on the next slide, it takes more force to push it as well. So this graph is a you know, it displays total thrust force as a function of tunneling distance. I mean, if you if you can see there around that twenty six to twenty eight hundred foot mark, you know, forces are starting to climb. Kind of radically and somewhat concerning too. Um, you know, we had a lot of discussion about this with Dominion and Michaels. You know, we were as as these uh, things as the force started getting erratic. You know, we were concerned of okay, are we going to have enough thrust force to be able to complete the drive? We knew the pipe would take more, but you know, we but we needed more thrust force from their thruster. Um, I'd also say you know that the tunneling, the face contact force was pretty stable during the entire drive at around 50 tons. So it wasn't, you know, function. You know, we were thinking it wasn't really necessarily a function of, you know, the ground or the or geotechnical geologic conditions. It was more so about perhaps the pipe, you know, being more restrained in the hole, developing more skin friction, you know, as the drive wore on. But Michaels did a lot to address all of our concerns. You know, when the, when we start talking about it, you know, Michaels started wor working through plans. You know. If, you know, they had two or three different contingency scenarios, you know, that we talked about pretty frequently that they were ready to implement at a, at a moment's notice. So, you know, after the jacking pipe it was, uh, let's see, I think they completed, the drive was completed, did I tell you that already? It was, uh, yeah, it completed on March 4th, 2022 after 110 shifts. So I just want to make sure I was clear on that. So, you know, once they completed the drive, you know, removed the MTBM, removed the umbilicals. Um, now, now it comes time to install the, the 36 inch HTPE inside the, inside the jacking pipe. Here are some photographs of that. Basically, Michael set up a, a HDD rig on the reception side, uh, ran drill pipe through the, through the jacking pipe and then connected up to it with a swivel, as you can see in the lower photograph and basically just pulled it in as you would you know, if you were pulling it in on it as part of an HDD, that went really quick. You know, I think they had to make a couple mid, several mid wheels actually, because there was only about 300 feet or so of, of workspace uh, that they could use to, to connect the pipe and and, um, and, and fund, fuse the pipe together. So uh, I think it was two shifts and they completed, you know, the, inter or the casing installation on March 8th of 2022. So, now it's time to uh, remove the sacrificial pipe. You know, we were all pretty, pretty concerned about this to begin with. Um, to our knowledge, it may have been done once or twice, uh, but certainly not an everyday occurrence in, in our experience in the direct pipe world. Um, so, you know, Michael's, their plan, their initial plan called to, uh, you know, just to use the thruster, start pulling it, pulling it back towards the launch side and cutting it into pieces and, you know, taking the jacking pipe off site from the launch side. Well, unfortunately, after, you know, pulling just a very little bit, you know, it was pretty clear that the pipe, it was going to take a lot more to get the jacking pipe out than what anyone thought. So again, Michaels was ready to go. Um, they basically had, you know, several different things they did to try to move the pipe. You know, they pulled on it with the thruster, connected winches to the pipe on the thruster side. Uh, they were pushing on it a little bit with an HDD rig and then actually, you know, the they pushed the, the HDPE down in far enough where they could actually put a hammer on uh, on the on the reception side to try to push it back, to help you know to help the thruster uh, pull it back. So you know, unfortunately, you know, they gave it their best shot, but unfortunately, it just didn't work out. 
you know, it did move, but it just moved slowly and there was no, no indication that, you know, it was going to move any faster. Also, they were concerned really about damaging, you know, the, the, the um, frame, the reaction frame, that the, you know, the thrusters frame and uh, the pit as well over there. They were putting so much force on it. So, and that, you know, Michael's come up with a really good plan now. You know, they were going to going to cut the casing, <laughs> cut the jacking pipe. <laughs> so this, you know, this was pretty innovative, I thought, you know, um, I'd heard of casing cutters before, but I don't think I'd ever seen one, you know, until now. Um, so the, the plan that Michaels came up with was, you know, push, you know, they went back and looked at all the tunneling logs and all that and determined where they thought they wanted to cut it, you know, where it would make sense to cut it. They pulled the, pipe, the HDPE pipe back towards the launch side, and then they put a casing cutter down in. Um, basically they can, they uh, configured it, you know, on the end of the drill pipe, um, between two reamers, um, and they ran it down roughly around 800 feet or so, I believe it was. Uh, and then, you know, basically, basically you pump water and it throws these knives out that you can see on the side and it's rotated while it's rotating and the knives are extended and it's, it's cutting. Um, so, you know, Michael's took a, they worked really hard on that, you know, wore out a number of these things. <laughs> I don't even remember how many they wore out. But they had it. They, you know, they were eventually able to get it, um, and they, I believe, they severed it uh, about about 805 feet, you know, from uh, from the re reception side on March 29th, 2022. And once they were able to get that casing cut, you know, it came out very easily after that. So, you know, they the research they did into the tunneling log, tunneling logs and developing the plan to where they wanted to cut it, you know, was was well well worth the effort. So. You know, once the once the sacrificial casing or the sacrificial jacking pipe was out, the HDP casing is in. The next step here with this project was to put interducts in. Now the interducts are are they go inside the 36 inch HDPE, and they they'll house uh, conductors, ground cables, fiber optic cables, you know whatever you know, whatever the menu needed inside them. Um, so, you know, basically same thing as with the 36 inch DPE, Michaels ran drill pipe through the HDPE, connected on with a swivel, pulled the interducts in. Um, but because this is a, you know, because this project also required thermal grouting of the casing, the 36 inch casing, they also had a few other things in the package. There was some trimmy tubes uh, and some things like that that were used to do the, to do the grouting. So those were part of the package along with some different sensors and things like that. So talk a little bit about the thermal grouting. It's uh, necessary to minimize the heat transfer between the conductors, ground cables, things like that. So you don't, you know, nothing gets melted, you know, while the uh, electrical line's operational. The first step is basically proofing the pipes. You know, it's done, probably a lot of you've seen it done you know, often. You know, basically you run a mandrel through, make sure the pipes, the, the HDP are good and round. Uh, and then once, you know, once the pipe, uh, the interducts are proof, the, you know, the next step for this particular project was to fix these connections on the end, um, basically so that you, air could be pumped down into each one of the interducts. The, you know, the, that's necessary basically to do a leak check and also, you know, to the, the, these uh, interducts were pressurized during the thermal grouting process to help, uh, help reduce some of the potential for collapse due to hoop stress. Um, another important piece for the thermal grouting is uh, the bulkhead on the ends. Now, the bulkhead is to resist uh, hydrostat hydro hydraulic forces created, you know, by pushing the water out and, and putting the place in the grout. So that these actually need to be designed by an engineer. And you, know, you can see here, that's the interduct package. And then the two things on the top, those are basically relief lines. So, you know, the thermal grouting, you know, it's, you know, like, like I mentioned, you, you know, basically once you have a couple, you know, 50 or 60 pounds, 40, 50 pounds or something of pressure on the, uh, on the, all the uh, interducts, then basically you just start pumping through the trimmy tubes. Um, the trimmy tubes have open, openings at different elevations inside the package. And but the idea is to basically start the grout from the bottom up and then, you know, you pump until, you know, grout comes out the, the tubes. And, you know, here's, here's another picture of, you know, a, you know, kind of some of the water coming out, you know, during the grouting operation. Um, so basically, you know, as you know, as we're getting near the completion of the thermal grouting, you know, we're looking at instrumentation from the sensors. We're looking at volumes of water that, that have came out, volume of grout that we pumped down. 
And, you know, those, those are all data points that were used to, you know, to determine how close we were or if we were done. But the final, the final piece of the puzzle is when you actually have, you know, grout being extruded. And this, is, this isn't a picture from the lower left picture isn't from this one, it's from a, a sister project. But it's a really good, you know, visual of what what you see when you're done grouting, and what you uh, hope you see when you're yeah, done grouting. Yeah, yeah, you're not done grouting until you see that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, it took a little longer, but um, I just wanted to give everybody a good indication of what the yeah, to tell. no, that's mm -hmm. that's great, Gary, and and lots uh, lots to unpack there with all the the different technologies involved. Uh, if you could unshare your screen. I'm going to bring uh, Matt and Tucker into the conversation now. Um, sure, I'll stop. Matt, maybe we could maybe we could start with you. Um, give get, uh, maybe I'll just throw out kind of a give us give us maybe some of your general overall impressions of the project. I know uh, some of the you know the, certainly the direct pipe technology was was new to Dominion. Um, Kind of what you're seeing, maybe uh, in terms of general trending of uh, electrical construction to underground and, and, and trenchless there, uh, perhaps. But just kind of open the floor to some of your comments, Matt. Sure. Can can everyone hear me good? You guys hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, I think one of the biggest uh, take backs that I have uh, the project itself. It's been going on since June of 20, 2020. So. Uh, Gary mentioned very early on a lot of the work that has occurred. Uh, it, it took place through COVID, so a lot of the changes that all of us saw in our normal day to day, um, a lot of the work didn't really. It never it never slowed down in the field. Um, you know, for us in the power and lights business, I know that there's probably some Dominion folks on from maybe the gas side of the company, but uh, it was new. It was it was a new approach for us. Um, you know, I work in within the ET lines construction, that's electric transmission construction organization for Dominion. Um, so this was a new application for us in the trenchless world. Uh, we're, we're, we're used to doing HDDs. Um, you know, we have worked with Michaels in the past, um, but, you know, we'd work with other outfits and HDDs, but we had never done a direct pipe um, within our organization. It was, you know, something that you would more so see on a gas application. So that was new for us. Um, what that took for us was to reach out to geo engineers. Um, many, many years of experience with John and Gary. Um, their team, you know, they they're 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 staffed up to where we were we were going in this, we were headed down a blind hallway, you know, and we had no idea what we were getting into. Um, so there were a lot of things that we had to learn, but our first and foremost, and I know there's probably some BDOT folks on the, on the call, but uh, one of our biggest challenges was we had a permit with VDOT and we had to figure out how to get from point A to point B, which was right around 4,000 foot in distance. I think it was like 3,800, but um, you know, most importantly, uh, we, we had to make sure that we played well in the sandbox with VDOT. You know, uh, they held our permit. They had the, the ability to pull that permit. Um, obviously, we understand their concerns. We don't want to damage road rays, but uh, um, when you have an IR event in the middle of 495 southbound traffic in the uh, DC metro area, um, it's pretty pretty serious. So uh, you kind of perk up, and you know you've got to. At the end of the project, we're all working towards an end goal. So. Uh, from what I experienced on this project, this was my second time working with uh, with geo engineers, both with Gary and John. Um, it, it was a true uh, group effort, uh, team effort. Um, I know a lot of our folks, you know, in, on the electric transmission side, it was new to us, so we had to listen. And uh, for many folks on the call, we're probably not that bet, you know, the, the best folks to listen sometimes. You know, we're used to just telling people how we want things done and. Uh, sometimes you got to step back and even as a customer, you've got to have the ability to step back and listen. So, um, John, I don't know if you want me to share any other thing. Oh, I'll, I'll that, that was great, Matt. I appreciate that. And, you know, uh, your comments about listening too. you know, we all kind of <laughs> like to drive in our direction and, 
and for a project team to really function effectively, we've all got to be listening to each other. But yeah. so that's good. I, I did notice while you were speaking, uh, we had a question about, and I think you're probably the right one to answer why uh, steel casing had to be removed, uh, why we couldn't leave it in the ground, uh, why we needed to leave the site with just the HDPE in the ground. Sure. Um, the quickest way I can describe it, um, when these transmission level voltages, 69 kV all the way up to 230 kV on our system, um, when they're designed, they're designed with a thermal rating. Um, you know, these things are put in service to last 30, 40 years before you reconduct them. Um, the quickest way that I can describe to anyone, it's like you putting on a winter coat and going out in the summertime. Um, that steel casing, it would have derated the line. There would have been uh, some magnetic fields triggered. Um, you know, as Gary, as he had described, the sister path that had been completed on an HDD design, it was successfully installed the 36 inch HDP. I think it was the H uh, yeah. 36, wasn't it Gary? It was. Um, <clears throat> we, we would have not been able to leave the 42 inch steel casing in because it would have derated both of those sets of cables. It would have had a, uh, a, a tremendous thermal effect on it. And yeah. basically when, when Dominion goes to PJM and says, hey, we're gonna build a line from point A to point B and this is what its operational capability is, we have to guarantee what that rating is going to be. And it, had we left that 42 inch casing in, we would have derated that coming out of the gate yeah. and Dominion would not have delivered on that operation. Yeah, no, perfect. I appreciate the, the detailed response there. Um, let's, uh, if we can bring Tucker in, if he's, I don't see his, Tucker, if your camera's on, bring you I'm in. Here. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, bring you into the conversation. Uh, kind of get your, maybe your initial take on, on the project, how it went from the contractor's perspective. Gary talked about some of the challenges that you all did a good job overcoming. Uh, but if you could maybe touch on some of that, and then uh, if you have a, you know, what you're, what you're seeing maybe in the electrical in industry overall as it relates to trenchless and direct pipe. Absolutely, thank you, John. and and. John, Gary, um, April, the whole geoengineers team, thanks for you know, including it, Matt and I um, in this conversation. And you know, it's it's been a pleasure from the you know contracting perspective to be you know part of this project from you know the the early phases of you know the direct pipe feasibility on through construction. Um, and you know, Gary, I thought you did a really good job of, of capturing the project holistically. Uh, of course, as geoengineers always does, and in, in feasibility and all through construction. But uh, yeah, you know, it was a, a project that was initially designed as an HDD. Um, there was challenging geometry, um, geotechnically. Um, there was some strata there that, you know, wasn't necessarily ideal, um, as we saw in the, the HDD design even. Um, so, you know, there was really a, a narrow window to fit that uh, direct pipe uh, plan and profile. And I think, you know, going into it, we you know, identified those risks and, you know, upon award, you know, worked well with, with Matthew and his team, as well as geoengineers to identify those risks, um, build out, you know, contingencies and, and options, you know, should things come up and, you know, lo and behold, there, there were some things that, that came up. We had a, um, the direct pipe installation take place over the Christmas holiday. Of course, we were um, being cognizant of, of COVID-19 and everything that came with that. Um, and then, you know, at, over, you know, just under 3,400 feet in length. It's a significant direct pipe installation. Um, we, you know, contractors, Michaels and others continue to push that um, envelope, but but still um, there's only a handful of handful of direct pipe crossings at that length. So um, all things considered, you know, um, once we started to see our thrust loads climb because of, you know, various um, delays in the mining process and everything, I think uh, the team worked really well together to come up with solutions. Um, that ultimately ended up in a successful project across the board. And, you know, I like to thank, you know, the, the Michaels, you know, field team, um, superintendents, project managers who worked hand in hand with the geo team um, and, and Matthew's team to, um, you know, transparently, you know, communicate and address those issues and, and move forward to a successful project. Um, on a, you know, a more holistic note about, you know, what this project means, to the utility industry or the trenchless industry, you know, I think this is a great example of how 
trench lift technologies have adapted um, with the changing utility construction market. Um, direct pipe won't necessarily supersede um, HTD or, or micro tunneling, um, but it, it definitely is another tool, you know, in the trench list toolbox. And as we look at projects like, like this one in particular, where we have, you know, concerns over opacity, um, steel casings, uh, direct pipe gives that ability to push, pull, extract casings, install different materials um, in shallower um, profiles where, you know, that might be the, the ticket when comparing it to an HDD. Um, but again, you know, every project is unique and different. And as we learn more about, you know, underground electric and the parameters there, um, you know, Matthew brought up a good point. I mean, just understanding the difference between um, medium voltage and high voltage, that 69 kV mark, that, that significantly impacts what an HDD, HDD or direct pipe design is. Um, and really until recent years, you know, contractors, and don't want to speak on behalf of, of GEO, but, you know, we're, we're still understanding what those parameters are and how our, not only our profiles, but our, also our material selections are going to impact those designs. So I think, you know, this is a, a great project that has helped us step into that world and, and understand a lot more, um, not only about the contracting, but engineering and, and collaboration across the board. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, you know, from our perspective, we learned uh, we learned a ton on the project uh, as we have uh, working on other stuff with Matt. So it's <laughs> been it's been a really rewarding uh, relationship for us. I'll, yeah, uh, as you were talking or uh, uh, a question came in, uh, Tucker, on any concern about uh, settlement beneath the interstate during the sacrificial casing removal. And, and feel free to punt that to Gary if you want, <laughs> but you know maybe you have some comments on that as well. Uh, yeah, certainly I can I can lead with it, and then I I, I probably will uh, punt to Gary here just with the you know, different uh, perspectives. But uh, again, when, when we extracted the casing, I think that was captured right away um, in the RFP phase, um, knowing that that was the potential of extracting that steel casing and, you know, the change in annulus there in a settlement was going to be a concern. Um, to answer it shortly, you know, Michaels didn't have a huge concern. We had a good plan in place. We knew we were going to fill any, any voids present. Um, when comparing it to a conventional HDD, the overcut is significantly smaller. Um, and then the, you know, fundamental process of direct pipe using a micro tunnel boring machine in lieu of a you know, a drill stem and a drill bit and HDD, the, the pressures on the formation are, are just significantly different. Um, so I guess to answer that question, Michaels didn't have a ton of concern. It was identified as a risk, um, but, but certainly had less of a concern um, when compared to like an HDD installation. Gary, I'll pass it to you. Okay, yeah, I think you, you, you captured it really well, Tucker. <clears throat> um, this The overcut's a big deal, you know, ordinarily for an HDD for a 36 pipe, you would have a 48 inch overcut at least. So, you know, dropping it down to 42 or 44 inch overcut, you know, that, that helps a lot. <clears throat> John and I also, you know, we recognized that concern very early in the design process. And, you know, we, we did settlement calcs to kind of estimate it, but we also looked at the most favorable uh, strata there to try to situate the, you know, the direct pipe profile in, you know, so that we could mitigate it as much as we could on the design front. And then, you know, also, you know, uh, we during the act during the tunneling operations, the mining operations, we actually had a project control point set up at 495. So basically, you know, if you can recall, you know, going into the mining, once you cross 495, you know, we have to really talk about it and think through it before you can extract it. So Michael's tunneled up to the edge of 495, made sure you, you probably recall you made sure everything was really good and you were you weren't going to pay, you know, wait until after the Christmas holiday before you broke the plane of 495. Uh, and continued the mining operation. So, you know, lot, we, we thought through it pretty significantly before construction even began. Yeah. Um, while we've got you on screen here, Gary, we've got a question on the in situ or were in situ or lab based thermal conductivity tests done on the soil slash bedrock during the geotechnical investigation? They, they were. Um, that was pretty early, even early. maybe. Predating our involvement. In yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. It was. It predated our involvement, and I think there was some additional work done on some of the stuff that we took out. Yeah. But not, you know, that was done way before. Yeah. yeah. And that also was used to develop the makeup of the, of the thermal grout as well. Right. Know, there was a lot of testing done on the thermal grout as well. Right. So. Right. 
Okay. And uh, Tucker, maybe if I can return to you, uh, April received a, a question direct about um, maybe maybe describe in a little more detail how the two ends of the casing were extracted after the cut was made. Yeah, certainly. So the uh, we we used a, a 750 um, ton metric ton 825 US ton Heron Connect manufactured pipe thruster. Yeah. on the entry side so that the same mechanism to install uh, once we made that cut we were able to um extract there on entry and then on exit um I refresh my memory gary or, or matt if you want to chime in but i believe we used a uh, uh michael's custom built 880 uh or 440 drill rig in conjunction with a pneumatic hammer um to extract that side that's yes sir that's correct yeah it didn't take much to get it out once it started moving. Them. It went, went, went crazy fast. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's a good thing, good reminder to folks who maybe aren't as familiar with the technology that with those with the pipe thruster, you can push it in and you can pull it back. So, you know, it goes, it goes both ways. So uh, we are coming up on the end of our time together. April, do you have any uh, final questions or anything that I missed? I don't see any, but if anyone does ha have any, throw them in the chat real quick. Um, yeah, did you address the direct the cost question about direct? Oh, yeah, I missed that one. So um, we're, maybe Matt, if you could, uh, to the extent you want to address this question, uh, the question was, what were the cost impacts by going to direct pipe? Um, right off the top of my head, 25 million. Versus not having the line in. So, <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's not, we're not talking about small change here, but when you need it done, it's a, it's a tool to get it done. Yeah. That's right. So, all right. Well, it was greatly appreciate Matt, Tucker, y'all joining us. Gary, good presentation. April, great job running everything as always. Thanks everybody for attending and go out there and have a safe summer and uh, reach out if, if, uh, if you have any questions or, or need any help. Take care. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>